have now the pleasure to read a text to you that was um, given to me by Teresa Kovac. Teresa Kovac um, uh, got her PhD at the University of Vienna and um, is now teaching at uh, Indiana uh, University. Unfortunately, she is another COVID victim. She's not sick, thank God, but she couldn't come. So I have this um, text, I received the text, and I edited it a bit uh, for, for this uh, event. Um, the, the title reads, Composer on an Unstable Ground, Elfriede Jelinek's Relationship to Franz Schubert. And also I have to say that the next piece that you hear is actually Elfriede Jelinek's essay on Franz Schubert. So this is a lead in to, to, the, to Jelinek's essay. In Jelinek's work, we discover many references to the composer Franz Schubert as intertextual references to his compositions, as literary adaptations of his work and as allusions to the person Franz Schubert. Jelinek has a strong affinity for Franz Schubert and repeatedly speaks of the composer as her doppelganger. Additionally, the intertextual references to his compositions and the literary adaptations of his work can be understood as her translation of Schubert's musical structures. Scholars tend to read Jelinek's interpretations of Schubert in terms of alienation, of being without a home, of being an outsider, being the gendered or racialized other. And Jelinek understands herself, the artist, the writer, as one who does not belong. Jelinek wrote the short essay entitled On Franz Schubert that we will hear um, next on the occasion of his 20th, ber uh, um, sorry, on the occasion of his 200th birthday, which can be read as a key to Jelinek's own poetics. She calls Schubert an enigma because she feels the tension that characterizes his music. It is something that lies beyond where it can be measured, defined, or analyzed. Jelinek's essay begins with the sentence, but how can it be that of all things, a small brook has the greatest depth? In German, aber wie kann es sein, dass ausgerechnet ein Bächlein am tiefsten ist? Already in this first sentence, she highlights the paradox the coming together of motion and standstill of the eternal and the trans transitory in one moment of time. Furthermore, she questions her stance and proximity to reading and interpreting Schubert and seeks help from the philosopher Walter Benjamin and his notion of history and aura that a piece of art exerts. The philosopher's work pursues answers to questions about the originality of art versus its reproduction through technology and its place in history as an object of time in space. Indeed, questions of time and space take center stage in Jelinek Schubert essay. She says that his music offers an alternative logic of time, a time that doesn't follow the linear form of progression, but instead allows us to experience time through its brokenness, through gaps and voids. Her texts often revolve around the void, the abgrund, the abyss, as she calls it in her Nobel Prize speech. Jelinek claims that her speaking derives from nothingness, from silence. But what does it mean? How can we understand emptiness or rather nothingness as the source of her reflections on Franz Schubert and subsequently from which her own writing is derived? How can silence speak or vice versa? How can speech be silent? 
While Benjamin's concept of history surely helps us understand Jelinek's engagement with time in Schubert's music and in your own writing, it is perhaps quantum physics that opens up interesting new possibilities to better grasp what Jelinek means with the power of silence and the power of nothingness in her work. The feminist theorist and philosopher of science, Karen Barad, has read Walter Benjamin with the help of quantum physics that says that the vacuum is not determinant emptiness. It is not without matter nor without energy. On the contrary, the vacuum is full of virtual particles that teeter on the edge of the infinitely fine blade between being and not being. This is what quantum physics calls the principle of indeterminacy, and Barras says that this indeterminacy is responsible for that void, and that the void is not nothing, but the source of all. It is the womb that gives birth to existence, according to Barad. Therefore, I suggest, and that is uh, Theresa Kovac, that we can understand Jelinek's void that she addresses in her essay on Schubert as the quantum vacuum full of virtual particles that may become or unbecome determinant because being and non-being are tightly connected in Jelinek's work. Both is always pos possible, while none is a given. Furthermore, Barat speaks of, quote, indeterminate murmurings of all possible sounds, a speaking in silence, a quiet cacophony, an indeterminate symphony of voices, and polyphony of emptiness, end of quote. The use of quantum physics terminology can bring us closer to understanding Jelinek's concepts of time and space and her reflections on Schubert. Being on the move, wandering with an A and wandering with an O, is central to Schubert's song cycle, Die Winterreise, and of course, also Jelinek's play, Winterreise. Such the first lines of both the song and the play, as a stranger I came, came and as a stranger I leave, fremd bin ich eingezogen, fremd zieh ich wieder aus, underscores the tension between the being and the non-being in the vacuum of time and space. The wanderer is more than just an intertextual reference to Schubert or a metaphor for the position of the critical artist in society. The wanderer in both the song and the play not only references the unstable position of the composer von Schubert and the writer Elfriede Jelinek, critical of the world around her, but embodies the infinite movements of the being, real or virtual, in body and word. The simultaneous, not yet and no longer, the might have been and yet to come. Jelinek's Winterreise is full of these ghostly particles, if you will, that always teeter on the edge of being and non-being. They reside, that is, they move and rest on an unstable ground of infinite possibilities for emerging and being in time, much like for the composer Franz Schubert and the writer Elfriede Jelinek.